TJ Event Planner will change the way you manage and run your business. Streamline all of your procedures and software into one easy-to-manage system. DJ Event Planner, the ultimate online planning tool. Evening and welcome to Tuesday night here on DJ and TV. Tonight you are in for a treat. We are going to be talking about a topic a lot of you have brought up and said, "Hey, can you do more things on karaoke?" And of course, most of you like to hear me use the Midwest version of calling it karaoke, which I'm sure Stephanie, you, that must make you cringe. I'm guessing, or at least you can laugh at people like me. Stephanie uh, Rivkin is with me tonight. Good evening, Stephanie. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on tonight. Uh, for, for those of you who haven't heard, we are going to be doing a DJ convention in Las Vegas coming up here in February. And Stephanie has been gracious enough to uh, come down, she'll be coming down to talk to you, or to a lot of you, about karaoke and doing the this generation's version of karaoke. And, and Stephanie, the reason why I kind of refer to it as that is that when we first started with this back early on and we had the i don't did you ever get to play with those big pioneer laser discs did, yeah those were out when i first started singing <laughs> okay so so you guess i just that. gave you my age <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were much younger <laughs> i would yeah I remember, that was that was how we first our first experience with that and and for a lot of people that's where we started and you know we were kind of like you know, we're going to be combining with the photo booth, the photo booth industry or any industry. When it started, there was money to be made. You know, there were costs, but yet there were, you know, they were money to be made and people jumped in, they made their money. And then as the prices went down, a lot of people have left. And I think, Stephanie, that's one of the big things that people are going to want to, you know, kind of hear is that there's people like myself who've been in this business. But now we're getting to the point where we're not as young as we used to be and we need to find a way to diversify. And mm -hmm. after hearing you talk about this uh, at uh, in Allentown. It's like this is this could be an area in which a lot of people who are you know 50 years old and older could uh, add this back to our companies and really diversify our business. I think anybody who has the guts to get on a microphone and possibly sing or just host can do this. And that was an interesting. You, you mentioned the guts to get on the microphone compared to uh, the singing. When we when we first started, it was like, oh, you don't sing? And it was such a, a faux pas if you weren't a singer. And and I kind of asked you that in Allentown a little bit, and you had made comment that it's not quite as required as it used to be. Kind of tell me a little mm -hmm. bit more for those who aren't singers but would still have interest in it. How can they be successful without being a great, a great singer? Um, well, I think you just have to know exactly what it takes when somebody's singing, which adjustments you need to make. So you have to have the right equipment. So a karaoke mixer that has maybe like four microphone channels, some vocal effects like a reverb and echo. And so when somebody's talking, you have a flat mic or they're rapping, you have a flat mic. And when somebody's singing some really high notes, you're going to make those proper adjustments. They're going to sound like rock stars and always come back to your show. So let's kind of take a step back here. Uh, you know, obviously, you're talking gear and, and a lot of different things within that. What, what got you into the uh, karaoke field as an entertainer? Um, so I started, it started as a gift from my dad when I was about 12. So I want to say it's been a good 30 years of singing karaoke. You could have said 20 years and we would have. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, well, I think karaoke keeps you young, if I'm being honest, because I feel the same as I did when I was singing back when I was 12. It started with that karaoke machine, just getting comfortable singing with my friends, really just, um, getting familiar with different genres of music. Cause I was into pop and, um, really like 90s freestyle for a while. So um, I just feel like when you find something that you really love and uh, you can make it into your pa your passion becomes your income, I really think it's a, it's a great avenue because I loved it so much. Um, I got offered the um, opportunity to cover somebody's gig one night and that's what led to uh, multiple gigs and then eventually owning my own business. So now you, you today, of course, you... you um... You, you were talking about having your own business and you have multiple uh, people working for you then that are doing karaoke shows? Um, so I used to, I used to have an all female DJ service and that all started because I just kept, kept getting so many karaoke jobs. I couldn't take them all myself. So I hired a couple females 
And now um, there is still that much work, but um, I don't, I won't take the, um, the time anymore to really uh, train and keep employees to work for me. So now I have uh, my son works karaoke for me and I pass jobs on to another company that has multiple employees. So if I'm in a bind at all, I just reach out to them. They send coverage to my gig and then I'm all set. So, so you mentioned, um, you, you had many, but you mentioned also, you specifically said that you had an all female staff. What was your reasoning behind going with an all female staff? And the reason I'm asking this is because when we were at our peak as a multi, two thirds of my staff were, were, uh, uh women. And there was a reason for that. And I, I'm just kind of curious of, of what your findings are similar to that. So I found that the demand was um, in my place. They wanted me to put another female. Um, and there's plenty of men. Um, and I think it's just a niche. Uh, people get used to having a female there. We do things a little bit differently, I guess. Maybe the way we host, maybe the way we, I'm not sure, the musical selections or something. But I just found that the, the demand for females was there. And so I tried to, anytime I couldn't be somewhere, put another female in my place. Sure. Sure. And, and it, we were finding as wedding entertainers is that there was a different, a different care that we were giving to the end, to the client from a female perspective as the entertainer compared to a lot of guys who would be like blowing off little details. And I, I not to be sexist against male DJs out there, but, Same. um, it, there was, you know, my, my wife and uh, Renee and Amber and, and Jan, they all had a compassion I don't think that as a guy I can just grab and grasp and, and not that it, but some of the the guys that I've hired over the years there was a difference so I was just kind of curious if you had experienced something similar to that uh, in in uh, your situation because yeah it was I when I went to Vegas for the very first time and I had my staff with me they're like how did you what how did you manage to have more than one more than one person uh, woman on your staff and it's like this is my whole staff right here and it was just, <laughs> just how it, uh, it worked out and worked out very, very well in the wedding industry. So, so, so you, you moved on, uh, you had your, your company and such, what type of events were you guys specializing in, specializing in when you did have this a uh, little bit larger staff? I like to consider myself an all occasion DJ service. So there wasn't any type of event that we wouldn't take. Uh, if we had never done it before, we would just be honest about it. So, uh, we just got our feet wet in every area that when they called, we said, yes. And if we didn't know what we were doing, we did our homework. So we kind of, uh, over maybe five years of working with other females, we covered sporting events and schools and colleges, private parties, um, corporate weddings and everything. So I mainly did the weddings myself and then gave the other gigs out to the other girls so that um, I could get established in the wedding industry, which was really kind of my um, a transition that I was excited to make because I still had a background in wedding and meeting planning that really wasn't using as a karaoke host. Um, so anything I could do in the wedding industry, I took. And then anything else that came along, if I was booked, uh, it would go to them. And if I wasn't booked, I would take it myself. So we're, ta we're talking in the area you're going to be focusing on is karaoke in February. You've mm -hmm. got your, your, you've been a wedding DJ, you've been a karaoke host. Which one of the two, I mean, if which one feeds your soul, for lack of a better way to describe it, and really makes you feel fulfilled when you're done with that event? Um, I'd have to say for a really long time, it was the karaoke events because it was the people that were coming and supporting me that really gave me that feeling of like, at the end of the night, I felt fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I think that after a while of, um, you know, 10 years of being in the bars and the late nights, I really felt my fulfillment was at, in the wedding industry because at that point I was putting in such long hours and uh, making the playlist and getting to know my couples. So really the fulfillment will came at the end of the wedding when the couple was ecstatically happy and they were leaving and smiling and just complimenting me that they had an amazing time that became very fulfilling for me because it becomes more about the moments that happen that night that I'm able to create because now that I've been to a couple of the DJ expos I'm learning so much so I'm trying to incorporate that in the way I'm doing things now and so I really want to specialize in really creating moments for people at their weddings now instead of just being a wedding DJ. And even some of that creating moments for people can transition over or, or translate over into uh, being a karaoke host, I would guess. You're very right about that. So for a long time, it was about making people feel special, feel, making them feel included. You couldn't do the same thing every week. 
So I really had to be creative for a while. I did some theme nights. I had a karaoke wheel. I hosted contests where uh, we had money prizes. Uh, the last uh, contest I did was earlier this year, and we gave away a prize to uh, a music studio to record a demo, which I never had that opportunity. So I was more than excited to give that away to somebody because I just knew exactly how they would feel winning that, and then the opportunities that could come, you know, from finally making your first demo. So, so you you mentioned, of course, that the feedback you get when you were a karaoke host and and making these connections and things. What was probably the most difficult part for you to to get to that point of having that success where people were coming up and telling you how much fun they had or they, they were back week after week after week or time after time? What was what was the hurdle you had to get over to get to that point where you were having that level of success? Um, I think it was the exhaustion. Uh, really just um, you have to go in there with energy. You have to have the songs that they want. You have to make sure all your equipment is working right. You have to really care. And if you don't care, it shows. I know there's plenty of hosts that simply go in for the money. They sit there, they hope people sing, they play some music, and that's that. At the end of the night, they collect their money and go home. For me, um, you know, I really get discouraged when the bar is empty. And if I can convince a few people to sing, even though it's dead, uh, I still feel like I've done a good job. But mostly, I want to make friends. I want them to feel like, oh, she cares. And when you know I'm tweaking their sounds and they know they sound like a million bucks, then I feel really good about what I've done for the night because I'm not just sitting there. I am putting purse microphone. I am choosing songs I think are crowd pleasers. So there's a, a lot of different things that go into the night where um, it's kind of like a whole production. You know, you're setting up. While you're setting up, you might have people coming up and talking to you because they're excited to see you. That's when I catch up with a lot of my customers. That's when I'm actually doing my setup the whole time is like, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of talking to somebody while they're, you know, rehashing how their week went. Right. So just showing them that you care by listening is, is forming the bonds with people and the bonds are what's going to bring them back. Those bonds, bringing people back, that would relate to or correlate into the repeat bookings from the different venues. Is Has that been something that that you've been able to, when you when you were doing the hosting on a regular basis, was it a six month contract year contract were you able to maintain that for multiple years how did that part go with maintaining those contracts so i never want to get locked into a gig that i'm uncomfortable with after a while i just know it's not picking up and working out i won't lock myself into a contract anytime somebody hires me i let them know i'll try my best let's give it a couple of months we'll see how it goes and from there if we want to continue we continue and if you want to let me go absolutely no hard feelings these gigs really do just come and go. And uh, I've had some of them for years. Um, I think about three years was one of my longest stints at a bar. And it was incredible. You know, you go to the same place. It's like cheers. Everyone knows your name. Nice. You're super comfortable. And that allows you to break loose on the microphone more at a place you've been to for three years. You're, you know, there's really no reason to hold back and be shy. A lot of these people are repetitive customers. So you've been singing with them for three years at the same place. You get to know your bartenders and like everyone in there is really just become a family. So if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But um, the main thing is following, um, finding a following of people that no matter where you go um, from city to city or bar to bar, that they want to come and see you because you're the mainstay of the karaoke. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And that ultimately becomes where you make the money is becoming that right. mainstay. You've talked, you've talked to gear, you've talked uh, performance uh, in our, our video here so far. And of course, then there's the, the software side or the, the, the content, the actual karaoke side of things. Of those areas, which one do you think that you feel is, is the most difficult and it takes the longest to develop? The getting the things and learning your gear, the performance to work with the people or, you know, today's modern software and how that's going to function. Uh, I feel like it's all equally important and you have to really get to get good at all three of those things. So um, if you're not a singer, well, even if you are a singer, you really have to get to know your gear. So when you buy brand new microphones, they don't work the same as all the other microphones. So you got to get to know your microphones. You got to get to know your mixer, uh, your laptop, your software. Those are all important. If you have a soft, I have two softwares that I use. One I've been using for over 10 years. I think it was a $99 program back in the day. It's called PC DJ, but that's not always my most reliable program. So on the spot, let's just say that fails. I have Virtual DJ, which is um, my DJ program that I always use. It's excellent for karaoke as well. So basically, um, you have to troubleshoot sometimes before you even have the problems because 
let's just say, for example, you get there and your one wire doesn't work, you have to have a backup wire. Um, you have to just know uh, when you get to different types of bars, when they have in-house systems, the different ways to connect your, your mixer into these different house sound systems. So um, it's really, uh, it's, it's a practice. And the more you get to do it, the better you're going to get. I've, I've learned more troubleshooting on the job than I could do practicing at home. So um, the more you get out to these bars and you set up in different locations and you get to troubleshoot your way through things, it's the best way, to, well, not the best way to learn. I mean, if you could <laughs> troubleshoot ahead of time, but learning on the job um, is really a great way as well because the next time it happens, you'll have sweated to death and freaked out so bad, you'll remember how to fix it the next time. Yeah. The, uh, the on-the-job training like that, does the, that's the stuff that's burned into your, your mentality by the sweat of the moment. It's like... <gasps> And you <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you don't want that to ever happen twice. So you better be prepared yeah, exactly. to learn on the spot. Yeah, if you, and if you make that mistake twice, maybe you better look for a different career. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I found that um, when I really first started, I can't give myself all the credit. I had a mentor and um, it, was a, it was somebody I had gone to high school with. He was somebody I actually sang my first duet with and he had a... Um, an entertainment company, but they were, they were magicians, but they ran sound and performed shows. So I was lucky enough for my first couple of shows to actually have somebody on the job with me in case I didn't know what I was doing to hurry up and help me so that I, there was really no failing on the job. My first couple of times, sure. and once I really, my feet were wet, I let him go and kind of had him on call. But I mean, you really need that. If, if you don't um, want to make a fool of yourself, then Bring somebody along who knows what they're doing, you know, and really get your get yourself in the door, but make yourself look professional at the same time, even if you are new. Stephanie, we got a couple of questions that have uh, <laughs> that have been been rolling in here. Uh, someone had asked. Uh, we had mentioned a little bit about uh, you mentioned PC DJ and virtual DJ uh, that can run the the content. Where where can a person be finding those those uh, karaoke tracks? Going back. For those of you who remember the old video discs that we were talking, these laser discs we were talking about, you know, we had the books, we had the discs, we had, you know, the C or the CDGs, and we hand out these little these printed books that uh, the companies made for us. And oh, it mm -hmm. was it was such a different. The world has changed. Where do you find the software? How do you maintain that for your your um, your, your clients? So there's a couple different options. Um, some of them are subscriptions. So Virtual DJ has a cloud pool and you can get a karaoke subscription there, which you pay for monthly. Um, when I first started, I bought somebody's entire company, which I don't know that you're even allowed to do that anymore. Um, so my when I started, my library was kind of already built for me. But when I bought that, I still had to maintain the track. So um, I looked for a, um, what was it called? I, uh, I can't even remember what, what the name of the uh, company is, but it was basically 750 tracks and you buy them on the CD and then you upload them. And that's kind of how I started the build library. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of um, legal issues these days with purchasing yes. and downloading music. So you really have to be careful. For a long time, I've been using a website called kjbill.com, and I've had people tell me that that's not a legal site, and I've contacted KJ Bill, and I said, look, this is my business. I really, I, I need something that I'm, that's a legal library, and he may or may not be completely legal. I felt comfortable with it, um, and that's what I've been using for the last few years, but also um, there's something called Buy Karaoke Downloads. There was a bunch of websites, I believe, that got shut down. Yes. The absolute best karaoke tracks are sound choice versions. And I believe you have to buy the entire library direct from sound choice. And if you're a long time singer like myself, um, or you get those singers who've been singing a long time, they come up and they ask for sound choice. So you really have to get yourself a sound choice library legally, spend the money. It's worth it. It's, they are the best tracks you can get. Um, and I don't really know. I think it's just soundchoice.com where you can go in and check it out. Um, but look up legal karaoke downloads and, and find what's best for you. But I find checking into the subscriptions um, are probably the best way to get started because it's so expensive. You're going to spend thousands and thousands on that library right off the bat. But of course, it's worth it and you have to want to do it. You mentioned, of course, sound choice. And, and for those of you who aren't hadn't followed what happened a, a few years back, 
is SoundChoice was one of the leading companies that was out there uh, finding uh, KJ hosts that were that had illegally ripped their songs. For audio discs, we can rip a CD, put it on our computer, and we're really not going to get into any trouble. In the KJ world, different story. So SoundChoice, as uh, Stephanie was uh, talking about, is with the licensing. They have a license, so you can take your disc that you already own and you can transfer it. You need to have this this digitally trans this license to digitally transfer the music to your hard drive. And I think Stephanie, and, and maybe you, if you know, but I think it was a couple thousand dollars if you owned all those discs. It was it was mm -hmm. there was a price. And it was a couple thousand dollars, and if you didn't, it was like I don't know five thousand dollars to buy everything. It was it was a pretty pretty substantial chunk of change. But you are getting the most amazing library, and you really want to be legal. Um, there's lots of issues if you're not legal. So, um, it's, if it's something you're going to make your $5,000 back within a year or two. Um, I mean, it's, this is your music and I'm assuming if you're buying all the equipment itself, you're going to be spending, you know, at least $25,000 if you're getting a good startup set. So uh, if you're going to buy the best equipment, you buy, you might as well buy the best music too. So make the investment in the sound choice because um, they are the best tracks. Your your longtime singer is going to want them, and they're going to be really disappointed with the crappier tracks because <laughs> there are some. Oh, the other day I put one on, and I just shut it off and apologized and said, "Let me find you a better version." Yeah, because yeah. nobody thing to something that sounds off key, and you know, just a terrible track is just there's nothing you can do about it. It's the singer has it's either that option or you know they're not going to want to sing at all. Yeah, and it's amazing. Yep. Yeah. When, when we were doing it and we had three or four different versions of a song and you're like, I don't remember which one was the best one. Well, obviously, if I could see that it was a a, a sound choice, that was the the grab. But there's times where it wasn't that. It was like star, disc, or deke, whatever. And, right, and it, DK. There's so it, many. Yeah. You know, and there were so many at the t uh, that were out um, back in the early 2000s. And it's like, oh, my gosh, some of those were just horrible. It's like I think mm -hmm. I think my four year old with a, a you know little kazoo could have done a better job on some of those. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, if you guys are thinking about getting into it, that's that's a great spot to start because the brick and the foundations, or the foundations and the bricks and oh, there's there was such a library there, a right. great resource for them. Um, so so, getting into to um, what we'll be, you'll be talking about a little bit in Vegas, um, we. There's a lot of people. This is going to, you know, we're a wedding crowd, uh, really, is what uh, this is, and there are going to be people who are are looking to get back into that. What kind of uh, things are you going to be able to share with them to, as a takeaway that can inspire them to look at this a little bit more? Well, I I had somebody come into my karaoke gig this past Sunday and hire me for their wedding. So. I didn't even know they were out there. Uh, and this woman comes up to me and she says, I got sent here by somebody who knows you. And I was watching you host for a little while. I'm definitely interested in meeting up with you. And so karaoke leads to lots of options. My first karaoke, I mean, yeah, one of my first karaoke gigs led to my first wedding. Um, and so really, um, and I've done some karaoke cocktail hours at weddings. Uh, I've done a whole entire karaoke reception. So it's another add-on package. Um, not everyone's going to take you up on it. Some people will maybe want a cocktail hour, but not a whole reception, but it is an add-on. Um, and it is a really good way to get your microphone skills. Yes. Um, I, I definitely think that my emceeing came a long way uh, just from my hosting experience. So um, it's just a great, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to have to offer if you're doing weddings. And if they don't want it, maybe they're going to think of you to have it maybe later on when they have a, um, like an anniversary party or something else. What kind of money is out there? Back when I ver our very first shows that we did, we were able to charge at that time, uh, generally probably about another, you know, fifty percent more than we could for weddings. It was that that profitable at one time for what we did. Um, today, I don't, I haven't done it so long. I don't even know what, where it's at. Is it something that has been kind of, you know, we've seen like the photo booth industry where it's gone down? Has it kind of rebounded? Where has it gone for a uh, quality uh, KJ or karaoke host? Well, I can speak for Connecticut. I would say we are a very saturated market. You can go into any bar in Connecticut and you can find trivia, karaoke, um, and then a cover band night. So um, there's money to be made, although some people are only charging, um, are they're only paying for you to come in and host because they have their, their house sound system. Um, so there's not much money to be made there. Mm -hmm. I'm, for myself, 
uh, I've been making on a good week up to 700, 800 a week. And um, then I, I have my private parties on the weekend. So I would say karaoke has gotten me maybe up to four grand a month on my really good months. Um, and sometimes when I've had my other private events, I've had up to $10,000 months because of the karaoke. Sure. If it hadn't been for that, I'd make a couple thousand, but the karaoke is what really brought me up to that $10,000 mark. And those would be weeknight uh, shows that you were doing? Right. Yeah. So nice. in one month last year, with all the karaoke nights, I was running maybe four to five a week, doing weddings every weekend. Uh, I was able to have some of my most profitable months ever in, in this industry. Very nice. Very nice. That's, that's I think, what a lot of people are kind of looking for, is that we can fill our Fridays and Saturdays, for surely our Saturdays, but to be able to find something that we enjoy doing, which I think is probably a big part of what you're talking about, is that it was something that you really enjoyed, so it was a win-win. It really was. I, I honestly, because of my job, I don't really go out much, so I kind of feel like I'm being paid to go out and paid to party and it's really not a bad job. I, I make the most of it. You know, I usually get a little bit of a bar tab to give me some food, some drinks, and the bars treat me really well because I'm promoting their bar. I'm bringing them customers. Once those customers are in the door, I'm trying to keep them until they're shutting it down. So it's really a team effort between really myself and the venue, if it's a public gig, um, to really get those customers in there, offer them some drink specials, offer them some food specials, uh, make them feel special while they're there, and give them a reason to be at that per particular bar because really there's just so many options certainly certainly as as you're saying in in the connecticut area is pretty much as it is across the board even in our small minnesota towns there are so many different options in the bar scene plus they're you're having to fight with entertainment at home nowadays to get people out and engaged so so true it's a, a different world um but it's, it's one of those things that if you're if you're passionate and you enjoy what you do it kind of comes through and i think it's uh, something that some people can be very, very successful at doing as you have been with it. So congratulations with that. Thank you. One of the things that people are going to ask, and I just wanted to throw this out there. They, they ask about how do you handle the problem, uh, the problem customers. And I'm sure you've run across <laughs> lots of those. Um, and you, and you can, this will be something you probably talk more about uh, in Vegas and such of how to handle some of those. But for those out there, um, Give a, give us one of those those kind of common problem customers when it comes to a karaoke doing a karaoke hosting, and how do you handle that person so you're not sending them away mad and they never come back? Uh, there's been a couple different scenarios. Um, I guess so. One particular job I had, I absolutely love this spot, and I have somebody who comes in and they really just want my job, and they want to co-host with me, and they don't want to get off the stage, and um, you know, every time they come up to sing, it's like a production and turn up my mic and turn down the music and tell, you know, like <laughs> on the microphone, you'll turn me up and yeah, boss around and, you know, you're kind of like, Hey man, I don't work for you. Um, but so thank God on my, uh, at this particular job, there is a, like a doorman slash bouncer who, you know, I just give him that eye signal and he knows, all right, come get this guy off the stage. So um, if it's if it's something I can avoid having to directly say to somebody, you know, this is going to be too much. I can speak with somebody at the, the bar and have them handle it for me, which is usually the best option because I think as a woman, uh, the most common problem I run into is having people think of me as the B word if I act a certain way or I talk a certain way. So sure. um, I, I've always been considered, which has been not the best thing ever, but too nice. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm trying not to be too nice anymore. Recently, I had somebody take my microphone and put it straight up to the speaker. And I said, don't do that. You're, and yeah. he goes, what, this? And it does it again. And oh, so, nice. you know, I may or may not have swore a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, it took me 10 years to get to the point where I feel like, you know what, you're for doing that because you know what's going to happen. And, you know, it's kind of like destruction of property yeah, for sure. when someone doing mic drops and pointing at your speakers with your microphone. So um, I really just tried my best now to just be stern, but not be the B word um, because it's just the last thing you want following you around in this industry as a woman or as a host. I like, I like your, your uh, idea though, where you are, you know, kind of, you've got the security person and you know that if you give them that, that signal, 
that they're going to oh, come yeah. over and casually take care of it because it, there's nothing where if we want to be known as the fun people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's hard sometimes, you know, you get all kinds of people who, you know, maybe it's their first time out in ages and they are just off the wall and you have to include them. You know, I've had people that sang a song already and they're like, when am I going to sing my song? And I was thinking, you just did like five minutes ago. <laughs> that same song, you did it, you sang. Um, but, you know, you just kind of have to laugh it off. And I always put myself back in their position because before I was a host, I went to karaoke for so long. I was a regular at a lot of bars and sure. I remember what it was like to be them. Mm -hmm. For sure. And the, so you have that sympathy, but then you also know that that they, when they get to that point, they've had too much to drink that they can be really, can be jerks pretty quick. It's, it's one of the downfalls, but there's so many pros to the few cons that, you know, you got to suck it up sometimes. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, in the description below, there is the link to go out and check out the tickets for our February event, February 24th through the 27th. We're going to be at South Point Casino with a three day, well, really four day uh, event. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is education. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is exhibit hall. And we're going to have a lot of great content. And Stephanie's going to be there kind of introducing for some of you to the, the karaoke in this day and age of how it is uh, put together and run and such and the tools you'll need to make it successful. And then for those of you who are experienced, she's going to share a few tips from her experience out there being a KJ host uh, in the kinetic area. And then after it's done, Stephanie, if people have questions, you'll be there to answer questions. Yeah, and then we'll have a big karaoke party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we should do that. I mean, if all the things we're, we're, we're planning, we should actually look at that. I'm sure there's I think a... that could happen. It almost happened in Pennsylvania. So uh, <laughs> at the end of the party, I think that was a great little addition to the end of the night. So so uh, we were in Allentown there uh, with the, the mobile DJ meetup. And it, it was wrapping, wrapping up and they were testing a speaker, weren't they? Well, I, we were, I was looking at it with Brad and Shannon. Um, and I said to, to Brad, you know, oh man, the, the microphone doesn't have any batteries in it. This would be great for karaoke because it, it almost looks like my very first karaoke system. Yeah. Uh, so basically a speaker and the microphone sits right in the top. So, uh, he went over and asked for some batteries and all of a sudden, uh, we're starting karaoke and, and it was so fun and it was all inclusive and I I think everybody had a good time, and I wish it could almost have been like part of the event. It was like, yeah, there, we had about twenty people uh, standing in that circle over there, and and there was this lady who had a voice. I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the, yeah, there was a couple volunteers. They were ready to go. And they I mean, were. I mean, I expected because of of your background and such that that you would you would step up and do what you did, and so, but then it was like there. Were, if the microphone would have gone around a circle and there would have been, you know, another dozen people who are just fired up and ready to go. It's like, it's the yeah. middle of the afternoon people. <laughs> it was such a fun time. It was like a really fun moment for me at the end. Cause I, mean, I don't want to say I started, I have to give Brad props for that. Brad getting the batteries is what got it started. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, if we can do that in Las Vegas, be, I think that would be amazing. Yeah, we'll have to definitely look into that. Cause yeah, they're putting some ideas together here in the next couple of weeks. So, so we're getting that uh, all put together. So once again, links are in the comment or the description area below. You guys can check that out. Stephanie, uh, looking forward to seeing you in Vegas and and hearing more about uh, what you, your, uh, you have done in the uh, karaoke world. And uh, people want to uh, reach out with any questions. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, call me. Call me directly, or if you're an emailer, um, so my number is 860-836-0140. I'm Stephanie Rivkin at gmail.com. I am at DJ Stephanie Stardust on Instagram. Nice. And you guys can go out there and you know, with email or, or Instagram, reach out and, uh, and, and say hey to Stephanie. And again, we'll see you. I don't remember which day we have you on the schedule, but uh, we'll see you in, uh, in Las Vegas coming up in February. Yeah. Thank you guys for being with us tonight. And um, we're going to have uh, Ron Ruth is going to be up here at the top of the hour. Then at, at 10 o'clock Eastern, we've got Jay Brannon and Brian Red coming in and talking music tonight. So thank you guys. We'll catch you a little bit later.